Today I'm talking with Po Chi Wu, whom you've now heard uh, something about, who's somebody that I've known for several years. We met originally in Hong Kong, and he is uh, really a perfect person to participate in this series uh, because of his the fact that he straddles both parts of the world and, and he has been doing that for some time. When we met in Hong Kong, I think he was already very involved in the United States. He was educated in Berkeley and in Princeton and uh, has been an academic. Uh, he's an investor. He's all over the place, which you will have heard about. Uh, so I'm delighted. Po Chi is in California today and I'm here in New York. So Welcome to Conversation 360 podcast, Po Shi, and uh, this Asia and the West series. Thank you very much, Susan. It's a pleasure to be with you. So when we talk about the conversations taking place between Asia and the West, and I know that is a very big topic, what, what does that mean to you? What does that bring to mind? Obviously, given the most recent election here in the United States, there are a, a lot of uh, trade issues, uh, geopolitical issues. I think we can talk a little bit about that. One of my favorite topics that relates to my work is that I think many Westerners, including Americans, do not have a good appreciation of the level of innovation, business innovation, as well as technology innovation that is going on in China. Um, now, there are uh, one one other thing, I, I think there's just a lot of misunderstanding, so I'm delighted to, to see that you are promoting this conversation. I think conversation is exactly what's needed, not only at the highest levels of government and business, but really among some sort of normal people. Um, <clears throat> because there are a lot of uh, bad things about China, for sure, uh, things to worry about, things to be concerned about. Um, the Chinese, the, my friends uh, in China and from China, uh, will tell you about things that they are concerned about that uh, are going on in China. Um, but aside from that, there are, are many uh, developments that are going on that many people uh, in, in America and in the West, generally in the world, do not know about China. Most of it stems from most of the good and the bad uh, actually stems from the fact that there are so many people, you know, 1.3, 1.4 billion people. Uh, the, the level of improvement, the, 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 the drive that they have to, uh, to build lives for themselves um, uh, and, you know, the... I was going to say the level of education, and, and I think that that is really important. You know, there are a few cultures in the world where education seems to be uh, really uppermost. I, I think all governments, all countries would say education is essential for the growth of their people. Uh, but some some countries push it a little further. Now, Israel, of course, is one of the, the best known. Uh, America is well known. <clears throat> uh, and, and China is, is much stronger uh, than India, for example. Um, so, you know, there, there are just so many things. Uh, it is, again, hard to hard to begin. Um, is there something that you'd like to particularly follow up on? Sure. Now, for, for example, you mentioned already that uh, many people in the West don't understand the level of innovation that's going on in China, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So are there other ways in which the Chinese, the, the um, understanding on the part of Westerners about China is just simply inaccurate? Are there other things that sort of come to mind for you? I think at the moment, um, the the geopolitical situation is kind of, I guess, uppermost in my mind in the sense that um, China, China is a country with a, obviously a long history and a, and a long culture. And it really is fundamentally, the, the culture is so fundamentally different from Western culture and particularly uh, American culture. And I'm thinking in particular about uh, these two concepts of democracy and capitalism, mm -hmm. which I think are um, really, really very, very much fundamental to the way uh, American um, business and, and American politics uh, are being conducted at the moment. And uh, I think 
one of one of the issues in um, in the Chinese version of democracy is they're not really sure that Western style and American style democracy will work in China. Now that does not mean that they uh, reject it, uh, and certainly does not mean that they reject the idea of uh, uh, empowering the the people to make decisions about uh, what kind of government they want to have. Now, the Chinese Communist Party, of course, has a position that, you know, we are the single unique party. We want to continue, uh, in that sense, ruling the country. Mm-hmm. And, and that's one whole, um, you know, direction. But I think the, the people themselves, the culture, is actually not one that uh, emphasizes the importance of the individual. You know, the balance between individual and society, I think, is fundamentally a little different. Now, you can argue, you know, either side. You say, we, we, we like this balance, we don't like this balance. It's a little bit, I'm reminded about Star Trek, which, of course, is another one of my favorite uh, television and movie programs. And, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Spock from Vulcan, Vulcan had a very different philosophy about uh, the good of the many and the, uh, you know, versus the importance of the individual. It's true. And that kind of informed the entire series. And, and I think it's not coincidental that the the makeup that they chose for Vulcan has a has some you know um, Asian kind of characteristics. That's the, true, isn't it? The eyes, <laughs> yeah, the, the ears a little different, but but there's something very Asian about all of that, right? And they they were very careful not to to do that. Um, anyway, I, I think. I'm always torn by this because I think I'm very sensitive to this question myself of of what, you know, just in, in terms of my family, my, my own groups, the working groups and so on uh, about this, this issue. And I don't think it's an easy question to answer. So I think what we both need to do, both cultures, American and Chinese, is understand that this is kind of a dynamic balance. This is not a one-time fixed, very clear uh, delineation that says, you know, it's exactly 50%, 70%, 80%, 90%, whatever it is. I, I think this is a dynamic uh, of culture as culture evolves. Uh, and partly it's because of, of different needs. And, and we can see this uh, even in America in times of stress. Uh, you know, more people come together in, in a particular direction. So this is not necessarily bad, but, you know, Americans tend to Oh, so this this will be something that your listeners probably would would find um, somewhat perhaps uh, counterintuitive. And this is, I think that Americans tend to be much more ideological than the Chinese. The Chinese are more pragmatic, which means they kind of go with the flow a little bit more. They they focus on practical things. They're not so tied to certain theories. Now. Theories and values are very different, right? We're talking about basic human values. I think at the level of basic human values, I think really most people around the world are very much similar. You know, we all want to have families. We all want to improve our lives. We all want to, you know, achieve something and so on. So I think personal values are not a problem. I think cultural values get to be a little bit more complicated, um, but... Uh, the, the kind of ideologies and theories we have or, um, you know, principles by which we want to, you know, develop our institutions, including business, that's where, where we get a little bit complicated. So one of the things I'd like to see your conversations, um, the direction for your conversations, is to move toward more personal values. I think when we can talk about personal values, then we find we have more in common when we talk about things we think about, our ideas and ideologies, uh, we will find differences, which is not bad either. But we need to remember that two things. One is on a value level, we are more alike than different. And second, we should, in fact, celebrate diversity, which is uh, not just gender diversity, which is the essence of innovation. You know, we, we if we were all the same, if we were all thinking in the same directions, then we would not have a lot of innovation. It would be, you know, life would be really boring. I, <laughs> so, I think you're right. Well, you know, you you very much epitomize the possibilities for collaboration between 
uh, people in both parts of this world. And I'm, I'm, I, I, I agree with you about the West's understanding of China leaves, leaves quite a bit to be desired. And the Chinese understanding of the West, um, I, I think, is probably greater. Uh, they seem more educated about what's happening. They're aware of current events. Um, is that your view as well? Uh, I'm glad you asked that question because um, I think that uh, the the Chinese view of the world uh, is fundamentally uh, a bit broader. And it's not so much uh, that it's accurate or less accurate. I used to uh, use the metaphor that um, American kind of communication, if you will, uh, or the American understanding, the way American culture understands, is kind of like uh, watching television in black and white. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese, for the Chinese, it's, you know, color in 24, 24 million colors. So it, 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 there are several issues here. One is about filters, and I think that's a very important question. Each of us individually and our cultures uh, have certain filters, which means that we kind of really don't see what's exactly there. Uh, we see not so much what we want to see, but what we are sort of conditioned to see. A lot of that is language. A lot of that is other kinds of familiarity. So this applies to the Chinese as well as to, to Western cultures. It, you know, there are filters on both sides. The difference is that uh, I think the filters in the Western culture looking at China are... Um, uh, how should I call it? Uh, they're more cloudy, as it were. Mm. So the Chinese can see more because they are open to seeing more. It's not necessarily that they're smarter or not smarter. Um, I think they, they work a little harder at understanding how other people are different uh, and perhaps accepting that uh, than, than Western cultures. Western, I think there's a one of the filters is, I think Westerners think, oh, if we can talk in English, then somehow we're going to understand each other. <laughs> That's well, obviously so not true. Uh -huh. But we, we kind of have that belief. Whereas the Chinese, you know, the, the country of China has uh, just so many uh, different ethnic groups. And they're over, uh, what was it? I think 225 different yeah. dialects. Yes. And, and so they're used to the idea that, hey, we're all Chinese, but actually we speak languages that are multi, um, mutually unintelligible, right? They, they relate back to uncommon written language, which is a fascinating idea. And that was just imposed by fiat, by one emperor. So there's one written language, but a couple hundred uh, spoken dialects, which are not not uh, easily understood. And so I think when you have that, that's almost a paradox, right? In, intellectually, you say, how can that be? How can we have a written language that we can all understand? And yet when we talk, we can't understand each other. And that, that concept doesn't exist in the West, right? Mm -hmm. In the West, you say, oh, well, we write this in English and, you know, we should understand each other. But clearly, Americans and Brits and Aussies and Singaporeans, we don't really understand each other that easily, and yes, more more so than you know from from a different language. But it's simply an expectation that we have, and and, and so not I think that's so accurate. Yeah. So, what about the recent slowdown in the Chinese economy? Has that had an impact that you're aware of? What's what's happening? Okay. Uh, clearly, the Chinese economy is slowing down for a number of different reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, one is the the government of uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, both, you, you know, he's he's up for a reappointment or re-election. Uh, I guess is it later this year or next sure. year? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so he uh, he's had the previous five years. This is another five years. He has put in motion a number of initiatives. Uh, that uh, are trying to redirect the, the economy away from uh, what's called investment-driven, you know, government investment-driven. Um, country, of course, uh, overall, the country of China is not a, a rich country uh, on a GD, you know, per, per capita basis. This is something, <clears throat> excuse me, that's difficult for Westerners to understand because it seems like they they have this positive trade balance in pretty much every category. So someone's making money, 
<clears throat> and, and that's true. They they are making money, um, and a lot of money is accruing in China. However, the <clears throat> uh, again, the population is so large uh, that <clears throat> there are still very very large portions of the country that are very poor. In fact, the income gap. Uh, between the rich and poor, the so-called Gini coefficient is very, very high in China. If not, it's, it's one of the highest in the yeah. world. Yes, it, it is getting worse. And so it's not even the 1%. In America, we talk about the 1%. There, it's probably, you know, a hundredth or a thousandth of a percent. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very tiny number of people and companies that are making a lot of money. Uh, and there is uh, just huge problems of poverty, uh, migrant, uh, migrant workers, and so on. But as the government is trying to shift the economy both from being investment driven and also manufacturing driven, you know, that's one of the biggest changes. That's where a lot of the, the growth has taken place. Um, that, that's changing because of um, costs, rising, uh, rising labor costs. <clears throat> and the way business is done is you always push costs to a lower cost country. Uh, so, <clears throat> so that's happening. Automation, robotics, and so on is also taking over a, a lot of manufacturing jobs. <clears throat> so the economy as a whole is shifting. Um, people overall, the people are, are becoming, uh, you know, better educated and, and um, achieving more financial um, wealth. <clears throat> but there's so much that, that needs to be done. So has that yeah. has that slowdown actually had a negative impact on people? Is there evidence <clears throat> of that, or is it pretty much business as usual? You know, again. Chinese as people <clears throat> as opposed to businesses. So, you know, in when you look at the businesses in China, <clears throat> there are at least three uh, categories, if not more. One is the state-owned enterprises, and they've always been struggling. They continue to struggle for a lot of the reasons that negative uh, that <clears throat> uh, people have a negative impression of China. Um, corruption, there's still corruption in China, uh, that these are <clears throat> run by uh, state bureaucrats and not business people. Uh, they are uh, supported, subsidized, so they're not really competitive in the marketplace. Uh, they're not investing in innovation and so on. So they're, they're very, very large and they're a huge drain on the economy and on the political system. Uh, then there are uh, private companies, you know, publicly traded stock companies and private companies. Uh, most of them are doing quite well. Uh, they are much more uh, nimble, I think, in general, uh, than uh, Western or at least American counterparts. This is where the Alibabas of the world show up. <clears throat> well, Alibaba is the next category, which are these more tech-driven, uh, really relatively young companies. Alibaba is, what, 25 years old, not more than that. If that, yeah. Yeah, and it's... Um, it's a remarkable company. You know, there, there are a handful of companies in China that are literally revolutionizing the world of business on a global scale, which is just absolutely amazing. Um, now, it's not global in the sense of appealing to uh, non-Chinese customers. I think there's still more Chinese customers, but they are definitely reaching out. I mean, Jack Ma, the founder and chairman, CEO of Alibaba, recently met with Donald Trump and said, you know, Alibaba's platform can create a million jobs in America for Americans. He said, but Alibaba is not going to invest in America. <laughs> We're just going <laughs> to make it possible for American entrepreneurial companies to sell into China and Asia. I love that. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. You know, that's just such a – he is such an interesting story too. Oh, actually, okay. let, me, let me just ask you something about that because otherwise I'll forget to. And that is uh, Jack Ma and Alibaba's purchase of the South China Morning Post. And, ah. uh, the last two weeks when I was in Hong Kong, I talked with a number of people about this and found that there is major skepticism on the part of a lot of people that say, oh – Ma's clearly made a deal somehow with the Chinese government, and this thing is not going to be an independent mouthpiece. And then there are others say, no, no, no. The evidence is that since uh, they've hired this Chinese-American, Gary Vu, to come and run the thing, uh, the idea is that, in fact, it can be uh, both a tech giant, uh, which would be new to this very old institution, but also that it will be able to retain its independence and for the first time make uh, really globally available to a lot of people the information on China that's not been available to them so far. 
What, what, what do you think about that? Any thoughts about what his intentions are? Yeah, this is a fascinating question because I remember some interviews um, with Jeff Bezos uh, when he bought the Washington Post. Now, of course, it's not really comparable because Jeff Bezos is simply a businessman. Uh, and the question, though, was, you know, would he somehow influence, want to control the uh, content, uh, particularly editorial content, but content in general? That's right. And, uh, there were some he, people worried about it. You're right. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, his the interview with him was, was brilliant. I, I loved uh, the way he said it. He says, no, he had no interest in that. He just thought it was a really important newspaper. Uh, and uh, he had total confidence in the in the staff, uh, and he just thought it was a it was a good investment and and something important to do. So Jeff Bezos is is also a very very impressive man, uh, who who you know developed Amazon out of nothing. It's just uh, remarkable. Uh, again, a revolutionary. But Jack Ma. I don't know if Jack Ma sees himself as like Jeff Bezos. I've never had that conversation with him. Uh, clearly, he, he's also had a very, uh, um, how should I call it? Not, not paradoxical. He, he, he's also had a, a lot of interaction with the Chinese government on both sides, meaning I, clearly he's been supported of the, of the government. The government holds him up as a poster boy for success and yeah. entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and technology. Uh, but he also pushes back. He pushes the boundaries of the existing regulatory framework. And he's done that very, very well uh, in terms of financial services. Not so much the original Alibaba uh, trading platforms, um, but, but in the financial services so side. Like they, is, you mean like the Alipay and that sort of stuff? Absolutely, you know, mobile payments is huge. Uh, that that whole side of the business is probably generating far more profit, I'm sure, than than the trading side and so on. And he's doing much more with that. And he's exploring all the latest technologies, artificial intelligence, and you know, they're very they understand how how to how to build this. So he he's doing both of these things now. Hong Kong Hong Kong is a very complicated situation, and I think. In recent years, events of recent years in Hong Kong, uh, and particularly comments and not so much real interventions, but certainly comments from the central government of the PRC, uh, do show that <clears throat> uh, the Chinese uh, government is looking to have more control over Hong Kong. I, I think there's just no way uh, to, to get around that. Now, uh, it's, so far, it's been indirect, you know, pressure on the chief executive, uh, comments about in the, in the press. Um, there have been some reports of incidents of individuals uh, in Hong Kong who uh, probably, you know, most likely have been um, treated inappropriately by the Chinese authorities. Um, I'm thinking particularly of the booksellers uh, yeah. who you know, may have been abducted and so on. Not exactly clear, but it seems probably true that they were, in fact, abducted uh, and detained uh, inappropriately. Um, so, so people in Hong Kong are, are understandably, uh, I, I would call it a little paranoid. Uh, there is more protest about this going on, uh, has been in the last couple of years. Um, recent events with the uh, uh, elected legislators, uh, shows again that there there are some <clears throat> some serious questions here about just how much autonomy Hong Kong can have. Uh, it's just really complicated. So so anyway, the South China Morning Post has honestly, frankly, never been that great a publication uh, in terms of um, I would call it serious news. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not so much inaccurate. I don't think it's inaccurate. It just hasn't. Not a lot of depth in terms it's of not, journalism. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, so yes, it's been independent. I don't. I do believe because Jack Ma has has uh, stated this that he has no intention of turning this into a mouthpiece for the Chinese government. The Chinese government doesn't need that. You know, to be to be quite honest. Um, there are um, plenty of publications that have their own independence. Uh, they don't have the stature of South China Morning Post, but even in Hong Kong, South China Morning Post is not 
again, is not taken that seriously. It, it's a good newspaper. It's an okay newspaper. It tends to be very local, uh, focuses on local issues. But at the same time, Pochi, the Chinese government doesn't need um, uh, a, a publication, especially one that might get even more reach now that it's going to become more technically based, uh, that is critical of China and of its government. That's true. You know, it, it's, it's hard to know. Yeah, it's Excuse me, what, what, yeah, the Chinese government works <laughs> in mysterious ways uh, at, at a lot of different levels. And, and part of that, too, is obviously there are a lot of different uh, entities within the Chinese government. Uh, and I, I don't want to say that one, one agency doesn't know what the other does, but clearly they, they are not all as coordinated. And, you know, I think maybe that's another point I'd like to make about the Western understanding of, of China. Um, it's not as monolithic as people would like it to be. Uh, you know, it's not this uh, incredibly efficient machine that everything is coordinated and and they're they're full of this intent to to bury the West. I, I, I just don't I don't really believe that that's the way most of the government works. Mm -hmm. Now, certainly uh, the highest levels of policy uh, from the central government, you know, major policy issues. Yes, that, I'm sure that's very carefully coordinated. But uh, at, at many other levels, there's just a lot of, um, I was going to say chaos, that's not correct. Disorder, that's also not correct. But things are simply not as well coordinated as uh, we would like. You know, we'd like to think our enemy is, is simpler and, and, and uh, simpler to understand. And I think that's one of the biggest filters uh, that I was talking about earlier. The Western view is let's make things simple, you know, try to reduce things to simple sound bites, simple concepts, you know, that we can verbalize and 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 talk about in in five minutes. The Chinese look at everything and it looks complicated. You know? <laughs> My wife and I have this discussion too. She's she's ethnically Chinese, but she doesn't think like a Chinese, and she keeps telling me that the way you think makes life so complicated. <laughs> Uh, you're 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 right about that though the difference there now you know in general because I know you don't have a, a lot of time to talk with me today but it, it sounds like despite all its challenges that it sounds like you're maybe bullish on China's future is is that right I think you may be because we've talked about this before you know I from my background uh, from my personal background from my work background it's a primarily as a venture capitalist I, I love the the paradox of being a venture capitalist. On the one hand, I'm very skeptical about almost everything and everybody. You know, I, I, I take everything with a grain of salt and I want to, you know, dig a little deeper. I want to understand more. But the, the work itself means I have to be optimistic, particularly in the long term, because otherwise th there's nothing to do, right? The, the, the caution and the skepticism is simply that uh, I, I invest wisely, whether it's someone else's money or my own money and my time, um, because I know in my heart that most of the investment decisions I have made and everyone else I know in the industry, in the venture capital side, most of our investment decisions are wrong. You know, they go to zero. So more of the time we, we are actually wrong, um, but hopefully we make a few uh, good bets on the long-term future of, uh, you know, a few groups of really extraordinary individuals. And so I, I have to believe, uh, I'm a humanist at heart, and you know that, I, I have to believe that uh, there's basically more good than, than bad in people and in societies. Um, so... I have to believe that China is on a positive path to growth and that it uh, wants to and needs, in fact, to have good relationships with uh, America, with the West, with other countries in Asia. Um, that doesn't mean that it's a straight line, simple process. I think it is very complicated. Um, all the other countries in Asia are looking to China uh, for leadership in a good and a bad sense. Um, you know, all of this, uh, South China. yeah, South China Seas issue is, is one aspect, this, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership that, uh, Donald Trump wants to, uh, to, to eliminate. Of. Yeah. Um, uh, the, uh, this whole One Belt, One Road initiative. I mean, there's just so much going on. Uh, 
right? One Belt, One Road could impact as many as 60 to 90 countries. You know, this is unbelievable. And thinking on this scale is something that the West simply doesn't do. Maybe you, maybe you should uh, yeah. just quickly, Pochi, tell people what is that One Belt, One Road uh, plan? <laughs> I, think, I think it's just uh, mind-boggling. It, it is absolutely mind-boggling. But, you know, it, it's the idea that uh, we can connect not only one 1.3 billion people in China, uh, but through not really quite through India, but kind of around India, which is another billion plus population, uh, and another kind of billion people among all these little countries, pretty much stretching from China all the way into Middle Asia, meaning Turkey. You know, Turkey is kind of I think the the uh, western end of this um, uh, this process. So. There are actually two directions of development. One is called the maritime, uh, what do you call it? Maritime um, Silk Road. That's right. right. And the other is the land Silk Road. And of course, this is a reference to Marco Polo when he first discovered, not discovered, but first traveled to China from uh, from uh, Europe, from I Italy. Um, these were the traditional trade routes. They've been trade routes forever, you know, across land and across the sea. And the idea is simply that uh, because many of these countries are still very poor, poorer than, than China, uh, and there are a lot of people that need uh, development, there are infrastructure uh, elements that need to be put in place, particularly energy, right? Gas pipelines, electricity, um, uh, roads, transportation, and so on. And once that infrastructure gets put in place, then um, trade can follow and economic development can follow. There's simply no way to build economic development without the fundamental infrastructure. Um, uh, so, you know, China has created an Asian investment uh, infrastructure investment bank, AIB, uh, which they pledged a billion dollars, and many countries in the world have participated. The U.S. is a notable uh, exception. Uh, yeah, they, they did not want to participate. You know, whether that's good or bad, okay, that's, you know, it's a political decision. But, and, and there are many people in China as well as elsewhere in the world who, who actually look at this uh, AIIB as uh, kind of more fluff than, than substance. And, uh, but but things are already happening, uh, and it will happen sooner or later. Uh, it may or may not be driven by China or China's priorities, <clears throat> but China doesn't want to own everything. And I think this is what's difficult for people to understand. And maybe one of the better examples to look at is the way <clears throat> the Chinese government and Chinese companies have been operating in Africa over the last decade, 15 years. Now, just, I don't know, two, three years ago, I saw a report that said that five of the fastest growing entrepreneurial countries in the world were actually in Africa, mm. which was a total, Amazing. you know, yeah. disc, yeah. And, and I, I'm quite convinced that uh, some of that, a lot of that was because the Chinese government, okay, so you can say the negative side is the Chinese government went in and was buying up natural resources and just donating billions of dollars to different um, African nations. Okay, that's, that's what they did. But part of the deal was they had to build infrastructure. So again, roads, shipping, air, um, and, and also in the community, they built schools and hospitals, and, um, and they made uh, this type of economic development possible. Now, uh, and, and so local um, Africans and African companies were also able to, to become more successful. Now, as they become more successful and more Chinese companies follow those initiatives, now the Africans are grumbling that the Chinese are taking over, over. Yeah. again. But it's not it's not some grand plan from the Chinese to colonize Africa. You know, I, I think that's maybe another one of the very, very fundamental misconceptions. Unfortunately, the tradition of, of America, our, our very roots of America come from the British yeah. British colonization. And so we kind of think, well, that's natural, right? There was the, the great um <clears throat> British Commonwealth that was supposed to extend all over the world, and it was very much an extractive economy, 
right? Just taking, using up all the natural resources and, and sending the wealth back to um, back to Britain. And unfortunately, the U.S. multinational corporate model is also has been an extractive model of taking, uh, you know, using low cost labor and using natural resources. Uh, and then unfortunately, not building a whole lot. What uh, I'd really like to make a point about where I think our global economy is going, which is we no longer can exist as an extractive, you know, com countries cannot exist as extractive economies. And I think China is very aware of that. And this is where all the new technology and the knowledge economy and all of these things are happening. And these are not extractive. These are trying to, if anything, I would call it more additive. And they're more focused on, on real people's needs. Um, you know, some of it, of course, will still be consumer. A lot of it will still be consumer driven. But it's still different from an extractive economy. Um, so, you know, I don't think China has ever wanted to colonize. Nothing in its history said it wanted to colonize. What it did want to do, what it's still is trying to do, is maintain a sense of what it means to be Chinese. And so, yes, there are these countries around its border. There's Tibet. There's the, 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 the Mongolian area, uh, China, I mean, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and so on. Um, you know, how do we define China is, is one whole question. I think it's very separate from saying uh, that China wants to colonize, uh, you know, the world. And I just, I really don't believe that. The Chinese government is honestly too smart to want to take on that responsibility. That's a horrible thing to have to be doing. Well, you know? if you look at it, I mean, they, they, there are a sufficient number of challenges within its own borders that it has uh, a lot of work to do. In fact, that might be the last question I, I would ask of you. It sounds as if... Um, in an amazing way, they are able to to really be engaged in all these activities while uh, shifting their own economy from a manufacturing based system to more of a consumer led one. What are the major challenges that could get in the way of all this working? What 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 could what could upend this? <clears throat> okay, so for the longest time, I've always thought that the the worst nightmare for the officials in China uh, is that there would be a public demonstration, some uprising over something, you know, anything. And if it were even a million people, which is, you know, nothing in terms yeah, of a exactly. percentage of the population, that that would uh, so severely uh, bring into question the legitimacy and the authority of the Chinese Communist Party. So this is where we have to distinguish kind of Chinese culture from the Chinese party. Communist Party. The party uh, uh, currently does enjoy, um, I think, uh, strong popular support. Um, there has, There are actually a large number of demonstrations ongoing all the time. Uh, and many of them against uh, corruption in the government, in local governments and state governments. Uh, a lot of them, um, you know, inappropriate land um, uh, acquisitions, for example. Um, they do protest um, environmental issues, um, uh, pollution, uh, problems with mm -hmm. certain um, industries like the coal industry. Uh, <clears throat> there, there are many instances of uh, more popular uh, awareness. Let's let's call it this. You know, clearly, even though China has this great firewall and controls communications and internet and so on, um, still uh, the level of communication and and the spread of knowledge within China uh, is obviously far greater today than it ever has been, uh, and uh, it's just not so public. Um, and, and this is another paradox in, in China compared to the West. And in the West, we, we air all our <laughs> dirty laundry. We, 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 the, the media in particular will glorify protests, even if it's you know, a relatively small minority of people who, who shout rather loudly. Uh, you know, on any side of the spectrum of politics, uh, politics or anything else. But in China, they, they prefer uh, the central government, the party, certainly prefers, uh, let's call it a veneer of harmony. harmony. They, they talk about the social harmony. harmony and everything. Uh, and at the same time, they're intelligent enough to, to know and be aware that actually there's a lot 
of diversity and, and discontent going on at a more local level. Now, again, this is a question of how you balance this, but um, clearly that, that is, uh, that's one of the issues. So I think that the, the, the people who are so poor in China you know, if, if the Chinese government cannot continue to uh, to do the right things, let's call it, uh, for the poor and, and for the migrant workers, so like 250 migrant workers, you know, that travel all across the country, and they used to do more of the manufacturing jobs, those are no longer available, uh, they don't have the education, they don't have a lot of the privileges of residency in particular uh, cities and so on. So they're very much disadvantaged, and then there, there are really large numbers of very, very poor people, you know, at least maybe a couple hundred million more of them. And then there are all the rural uh, cities and so on. So there's, there's just a tremendous amount of very basic development. And, and we're talking, again, infrastructure, physical infrastructure, educational infrastructure, health infrastructure. So the, the work really is, uh, is, is monumental. And again, it's just always about the scale. You know, when we come back to this over and over again, so much of the misunderstanding is about scale. When you talk about uh, a thousand lives being lost to some disaster, you know, in a mine in Sanxi province, of course, it's horrible and it's a terrible thing for for those families and and for the local economy and so on. But out of a billion, some people, yeah, you know, happens. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's not callous. The, the problem is, it's not callous. It's just a, 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 an acceptance of the fact that the scale is different in in America. If we have you know, a hundred people uh, die by gunshot. We think, oh my God, it's you know this incredibly horrible thing, and it is. But you know, in, the perspective is different. I'm not saying one is better than the other. Please, well, I, this, I, this is I, important. No, I, I think that that that's clear. I think what, what the point about that you're making, though, and it's a big one, is that uh, there are so many people now who have not thus far been able to enjoy the fruits of this tremendous growth. Uh, positive economic growth in China, and they are no longer uh, unaware of the of the things that are being enjoyed by others, not just within China but elsewhere. So that keeping keeping harmony, if you if we call it that, among all those people, so that they have a sense that they will ultimately be taken care of. That's got to be a critical piece here, and I think that's what you're saying. Yes, I do, and and that's you know kind of one of the. Uh, issues about uh, migration. You know, a lot of Chinese, <clears throat> increasingly large numbers of Chinese are being educated, uh, particularly at the university level, outside of China. Uh, people who have accumulated wealth in China, Chinese, and uh, they are moving money out of China. This is happening at a at quite a you know increasing pace, accelerating pace. Um, the Chinese students who come to Hong Kong or to the United States, uh, many of them actually want to return to China after they acquire some education and some work experience because the growth opportunities are you know, still much greater. But having said that, um, uh, they, they would still prefer to have a uh, residency or a green card or they move their families. You know, quality of life in China is still in, very harsh. Um, the, the big cities, uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, uh, everyone knows that the, the climate, the environment is really toxic. It's just, it's just a terrible place to, to raise a family uh, and enjoy quality of life. Uh, people live there to do business there uh, because the, the, the growth is, is still continuing to be uh, stronger than anywhere else in the world. And there's still so many more opportunities. Uh, they, they, you know, it's, it's, it's more difficult and, you know, you have to know more and you have to do it better. Uh, but this is, again, these are all just really normal growth processes. So I think, you know, to sort of close this up, um, uh, number one is scale. Number two is China is still very new <laughs> as a country, you know. Um, uh, it, I shouldn't say that. It has an enormous history, right, longer than, than any other culture, 5,000, 6,000 years. But as a as a as a nation in kind of the modern world, it's you know, like still 30, only four, 30, four, 30 some years. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's barely 40 years old. And to see the changes that have taken place from where it was 40 years ago to today is nothing short of amazing uh, and miraculous. So 
at that kind of rate of growth and this level of maturity in this context of the global uh, uh, ecosystem as we understand it, uh, we have to accept the fact that there's a lot of bumps along the road, lots of things that are uneven, lots of things that are unfair, and, and you know, the human rights issue and the pollution issues and energy consumption, the extraction economy. These are all things that are, um, are very real. I mean, they're really real problems uh, for China. Uh, they, they are for the rest of the world, but they're really important for China because – uh, and this has always been their argument. In order to grow, they have to use the resources they have, mm-hmm. for example, like coal. And there, there really is no choice. But they also have been building more nuclear power plants than any country in the world. And they, they export that technology. It's very good, reliable technology. They have the most um, investment in solar farms, the most um, – how should I call it? implementation of, of solar energy in the world, and that's increasing. Uh, they're doing all of these things. So, so on the one hand, they're they're trying to lead in the front, but they're also trying to pull up from the back. You know, everything that's coming along, and it's got to be uneven. And it's not so much I'm arguing for tolerance or acceptance of the bad things that that are going on in China or the Chinese Communist Party. You know, again, I think that for me personally, um, uh, as you as you ask, I have to be optimistic. I have to believe uh, in the goodness of people in America, in other countries in the West, in in China, South America, wherever. I believe that fundamentally, uh, you know, a majority of people want to to have the you know do the right thing and and have a have a good life. And I think that's also true in China. I think. Because we, the West has so little understanding or, or so cloudy sort of understanding of, of China, you know, greater uh, tolerance, uh, more, uh, more dialogue for sure, more, uh, more interest to really see what's there. Uh, all of this can be, you know, it's only for, for the good of, of everyone. And that's not easy. We're not taught that, you know, in the West or, or in China, both uh, China you know, it's going through this wave of nationalism and, you know, they think we can do everything. We don't need foreigners. We don't need foreign technology. Uh, we can do it all ourselves. And, you know, our government has money and so on and so forth. And, you know, it's, you know, the, it's a, the, it's a the time, resources yeah. are there. Well, you're right. It's a time for understanding and acceptance on both sides. And I think this is this is a great place to stop, I think. Although, Pochi, I know we've had conversations like this thing go on and on. <laughs> but, but the idea here is that this very kind of conversation, I think, can do a great deal to help people get more of a picture of the complexities of what's involved and how we are ultimately sort of all in this together. So I, I really thank you for participating in the in this 360 Conversation series, especially this Asia and the West series. Uh, um, you're always just a font of information. Thank you so much. It's been a delight. Thank you very much, Susan. It's a pleasure. Thanks.